The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. This podcast is brought to you by MetLife 360 Health. MetLife has partnered with Teladoc to provide 360 Health virtual care, which gives your clients access to more than 50,000 local and global medical specialists through the convenience of the 360 Health virtual care app. And best of all, it's at no extra cost as part of their MetLife Protect policy. 360 Health helps to defend against serious illnesses so you can live healthier for longer. MetLife, inspired by you. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and I'm pumped to be back here chatting with the one and only Mr. Brett Evans. Uh, We were just having a bit of a banter offline and uh, we spoke uh, uh, almost three years ago, um, uh, shortly after Brett moved over to the Middle East to set up his business over there, clearly he's nailed it. Amazing timing going into a global pandemic, um, but has, has managed to uh, to thrive. So I'm keen to unpack a bit about that journey. But um, for anyone that uh, hasn't come across Brett before, which would probably be pretty much no one, but Brett's the founder and managing director for Atlas Wealth of the EMEA which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa regions of his, of his business. I uh, didn't know that that was a thing, but uh, Brett, welcome, buddy. Good to have you. Mate, thanks for having me on and uh, good to catch up. And a bit of water has been under the bridges since uh, since our last catch up. You know, he, he knew that six months after we last caught up, we'd be dealing with a global pandemic. I know, totally. And, uh, and clearly a bit of a... Um, yeah, like more of an issue for for you in that you you know you're just setting up uh, camp over over in Dubai to deal with all of these people that are jetting around the world, um, you know, into the Middle East. What? How did that? How did that play out? And and what was the impact from a from a COVID perspective, clients, and um, how that worked? Look, I think it yeah, it wasn't ideal. We got our um, so we're dual regulated, obviously ASIC, and then. And other regulators, the Dubai Financial Services Authority, who work very closely with ASIC, both and built on common law principles. And uh, the interesting part was we got our license on the 27th of February, 2020. And uh, yeah, here we go. And then this little thing called COVID started popping up on the screens. And um, fast forward, the world goes into chaos. And you could put your head in the sand and think, oh my God, what have we done? Um, you could certainly run back to mama or you could just go, righty oh, this is what, what's been dealt, let's get on with it. So for, it was sort of COVID didn't really change anything in terms of what um, how we operated. You know, we've been operating digitally since 2011 when we were founded. You know, we were Skype back then and Zoom now. No more wet signatures, which is good. Back then it was a lot of wet signatures, so it used to take six weeks for mail to arrive with application forms. But mm. the interesting part was it was a great test for Atlas because nothing really changed. You know, our our BCP plan, our business continuity plan was go home and nothing changed. <laughs> you know, we've got everything's well on cloud-based and the only thing that changed from a client's perspective was the uh, was the image behind us. So then you could sort of go into care and maintenance. But one thing, you know, it's scary to think I've been doing this for what, 25, 26 years now. Um, having gone through Asian financial crisis, tech boom, tech bust, September 11, GFC, now the pandemic. One thing I learned from that was actually sometimes it is the greatest opportunity when you are building a business because people need that handholding, they need that 
governorship or stewardship by a professional to help them get through this situation. And whether it's making decisions or deciding on, you know, what to do or taking advantage of opportunities in the markets, whatever it might be. Um, mm. So we we started running uh, weekly back-to-back webinars, live webinars. These things will go for two and a half, three hours long with Q&A at the end and everything. And, you know, we had over 500 people per session on these things from over 50 countries dialing in. And to us, it's more about cutting through the bullshit. What we know, this is what's happening. At that time, there was a very large piece of punitive tax legislation going through that was going to affect expats with respect to main residence exemption on their properties. Mm. So people were really nervous about that. Are they going to defer it? We were busy running, you know, uh, change.org type um, petitions to try and petition Canberra to give it 12 months extra because uh, people were locked in, locked out of the country. They couldn't manage their assets. They couldn't do anything. So it was really just a scramble through uh, the early part of 2020. By mid-2020, um, Dubai had taken a very much a, a practical commercial view on things. They spent the lockdown periods building procedures and policies for the long term. So we were back in the office early July 2020 and have been back in the office ever since then. So then it was a matter of, okay, how do we integrate this Australian office in the Dubai office? And, and the easiest way is to have separate systems and separate policies and separate everything um, mm. to suit the jurisdiction. But the the, yeah, the, the BHAG and the BHAG, the big hairy ass goal, was always to have a global firm with polarity of systems across the board so people could move between offices and there would be no difference. They virtually sit at a desk, they type in their login and they got everything at disposal that they had at their previous office. So that was certainly a big, a big uh, push because even though our regulator here is common law like at, like Australia and the UK, there's probably eighty five percent crossover in terms of regulations. So they do some of things here a little bit differently. So it's okay. How do we bake that into our existing procedures and make it you know very similar? So that's what it was about. And then obviously Australia having the borders closed um, that created a lot of problems for us. Because mm-hmm. hey, I, you know, I've been back to Australia since June 2019, um, so that's a big one for me. Um, but also too, as we ramp up, because we are so busy, um, we couldn't hire anyone out of Australia. No one wanted to leave. Everyone was very concerned mm-hmm. by what was happening overseas, even though what was happening overseas probably wasn't as bad as it was being portrayed by the Australian press. Um, yeah. So, but there was that fear and concern. Thank God, on the first of November last year. Scomo, you know, signed the paper to uh, remove the other uh, quota system, and things have changed a lot since then. You know, there's been an exodus of people moving overseas. Um, there were those who were planning on being an expat through COVID and had to defer those plans, plus people who just need to get out. And um, <laughs> now in that sort of situation of just trying to, um, you know, trying to play catch up. Totally, yeah. Look, I, I think it, for us that we had to do a lot of adapting with the the COVID situation, um, which was challenging enough with all the uncertainty and you know new dynamics of of everything. I can only imagine with with trying to do it in a in another country um, as well, and and sort of picking things up over there. But look, one of the things that you touched on there, which it, we were chatting a little bit about, is around legislation, and you know you're working across a couple of different. Uh, legislative frameworks with your business and and clients and obviously working with the big expat client group that you're you know familiar with different um, jurisdictional rules as well more broadly than just the financial advice legislative uh, requirements that you're working to but how do you go about tackling them and I know that you're big on trying to stay ahead of legislative change um, as much as you possibly can how have you gone about that in your business? Look, I mean, there's a lot of research to be done. You don't know, just decide to set up an office overseas and just do it. You know, there's like about a probably two or three year build up to that process of research, research, understanding the living parts. Unfortunately, even with an exhort a massive amount of research, you probably only understand 30% of it until you get there. And then you get on the ground. And then to me, it's about surrounding yourself with people who do have the answer and do know you know the uh, the answers that's the big one you know it's it's funny how clients will often source an advisor or a planner by referral and when you're overseas you do the same sort of thing to find an accountant who understands 
how to tra- handle VAT in the UAE and GST in Australia. So mm-hmm. there's a unique skill set. You've got to find that person and, and surround yourself with, with those people. And they become invaluable because once you have that, then you get fast again because rather than you spending two days trying to find the answer to a problem and not getting anywhere, it's one email sent off in five minutes and they come back with the answer concise to exactly what you need. So the hardest thing is how do you integrate two licenses together um, while keeping the client experience the same and not trying to have different rules and regulations. So once again, you know, spending a lot of money, a lot of time talking to people about what we can get away with. Sometimes pushing back is a big one. You know, we always talk about, you know, sometimes if people will tell you the easiest answer, sometimes it's what you don't want. So you just got to find someone who give the answer that you you need. Um, and then, you know, just putting it into, into the process and, you know, making it part of your, your procedures. And um, I think that's what we're really proud of. You know, James and I spent just – stupid amount of energy and resources in getting to this point of virtually someone can land on a plane from Dubai today and as long as they're on the Australian Financial Advisor Register, they can come in, bang. It's just, it's We call the Dubai office the embassy because it's full of Aussies. Admin officer, CSM, compliance officer, myself, you know, and, uh, and advisor, we're all Aussies. So I think it's keeping that North Star and keeping true to that legislation is difficult to cope with. And they always change. So once again, keeping your, your ear to the ground. And uh, sometimes you anticipate something, sometimes you can't, but just having good people in your network who will um, share information is the, is the biggest thing. It's people power. And how much has it helped though? Because I know that you guys have been like fee only since early on in the piece and and some of those things that are maybe not as legislative, but like compliance requirements. Do you, was that, I actually haven't asked you this question before, but like, was that, Part of that done in, in the, with the intention of you know creating global offices and you know no, I suppose how is that tied in together? To me, it's what felt right, you know. And look, I get the whole premise behind commissions and stuff and subsidising uh, you know different people's uh, cost of ex- advice and those sort of things. For us, you know, it, it it felt natural to us. It always felt that you know we make a t-shirt, we sell a t-shirt, we get a price for it. You know, in this case, we build an SOA, we provide an SOA, we get a price for it. It just felt like a, um, a more of an attribution on the work that we provide. You know, our SOAs can go from 40 pages to 140 pages. Um, we want people to see that value, and that's why we started charging for SOAs so early on the piece. To me, the big one has never been about losing your path in terms of different legislation. You know, certainly coming here, I remember sitting down with the DFSA the first time and I explained to them, sometimes we provide advice and don't recommend anything, no products. Mm. And they, that is going to be cross-eyed. But at the same time, <laughs> they were excited about it because this region here, like Asia, it's still the Wild West when it comes to uh, a lot of the cowboys, the offshore IFAs selling the 10-year Isle of Man bond nonsense that haven't mm. been sold in Australia and the UK for the last 20, 30 years because they're so crap. The big yeah. thing we talk about is, you know, when you're selling that client to, you know, to a platform. Whereas for us, you know, we talk about executions, probably 20 or 30% of the, the advice process. There's a big strategy piece there. And, you know, we call it two-dimensional advice. You know, where your assets are, which is Australia, where you are, Dubai, France, UK, Germany, doesn't matter where you are, and how those mm. two came mingled together. Um, the more clients you build up in a certain country, the more match fit you are. So, um, you know, to us, there's hubs, you know, Dubai and obviously Saudi and, and places in the GCC region, there's not a lot of tax considerations there. Uh, but when you go into France, where there's a lot of Aussies, and UK, there's a lot of Aussies, and Germany, there's a lot of Aussies, you know, you can talk about it. Look, it does. And nine times out of 10, you learn it by providing it for the first couple of times to a particular client. Mm. And then the next client comes on, it's just like, bang. You know, yeah. I mean, I can tell you if you, if you go into Copenhagen and you hold Australian ETFs, they'll do a mark-to-market on an Australian ETF and tax you on unrealised gains. So whereas if you hold direct shares, they don't. So for particular clients going to Copenhagen, we don't recommend ETF portfolios. Otherwise, they'll be taxed on unrealised gains. Mm. So it's those sort of things, but you don't know unless you know. And our clients yes. are the same. They come to us because they don't know what they don't know. And for us, it's just been doing it for you know, 10, 11 years now. Um, we've seen it all. Totally. And what are you talk, think, thinking more broadly across your business? You know, um, you've been in, been at it for over a decade. 
What have been the biggest things that have changed for you guys in terms of what you're doing for clients, you know, how you're doing it and how you're working as a business? To me, compliance. Yeah, and I'm sure everyone out there is not surprised when I say that. You know, the advice side hasn't really changed. The, the type of advice has to a certain degree with legislative changes, but it's the compliance side, you know, and how we, you know, try and find the highest level of compliance but not the highest level of burden when it comes to resources. So mm-hmm. trying to be smart on that sort of stuff. And to me, you know, it's involved a couple of changes with respect to company structures. You know, we get the power planners to do more than what a normal power planner does. Um, we want the advisor advising. We want the advisor client facing. So when you look at an onboarding process for the client, there's very low touch points from the advisor's point of view. When it comes to sending out the SOAs and doing all those things, the actual um, power planner does that. And we do it for two reasons. A, because once the advisor signs off, you know, the power planner can, can sort of send those out. But B, we know that that SOA going out is sent out properly with the appropriate PDSs and all those sort of things sort of attached in mind because that's the power planner's job. Whereas the advisors, as we know, they love to send stuff out, they get excited and, oh, sorry, I forgot that, I forgot this. You know, that to no, me, that, that's that, that complaint. doesn't sound like an advisor. <laughs> I know <laughs> I've never done that before. You and I are both uh, current and former <laughs> advisors, so, you know, you sort of you, you pay – uh, homage to your uh, to your roots, and then think, look back when you were just a pure service and your buyers and no business ownership. You know what you did right, what you did wrong, and then try and work out a way that um, makes that job that process a lot easier. Whereas, and, and that's the thing I think, you know, compliance is here to stay. And and I remember working for a group called um, Salem Smith Barney back in two thousand and one. That was now part of Citigroup, and we could open up an account as long as the person was on the white pages. We'd accept a million dollars if that person was on the white pages or electron roll. No SOA, nothing. And then the FSR came through and all hell broke loose. We had to do a one or two page SOA about yeah, the risk profile and, and what we're recommending thereby. One thing it's taught me is that there's always a better time in the past from a compliance point of view and it's always going to get harder in the future. So rather than just reacting to every change, get ahead of it, go above and beyond what they're requiring now, set the, mm. set the bar a lot higher. So you sort of almost get five years of breathing space. You can just, just put your head down and go. Yeah, yeah, totally. I know that for us when when I started Pivot in 2015, I did, I was pro, I did feel that charging a fee for a service for insurance advice was, was probably better for clients. I know that there's a lot of different ways that, um, you know, people deliver great advice when it comes to insurance, but that was my view. But I, at the same time, I did also see the writing on the wall with the life insurance framework, um, the review coming in that um, that was happening. And I think for talking to a lot of people that did um, get a significant portion of their revenue from risk insurance commission, that then they they went through a period of like four years of uncertainty, you know, people trying to fight change. What does it look like? Different companies, different policies, different approaches, different transition plans. And, you know, for me, it so it didn't have to think about that uh, mm. at all. It's like now, we, you know, charging fees from like um, bank accounts as opposed to products because they're just different companies got different requirements for these product-based fees. And I think that that's only going to increase over time. So, for us, I found it really helpful to go, okay, well, something's in the water. We know where it's sort of heading, like may as well just do it. And then like you say, that at least you're, then you're in front of it and things will need to change over time. But hopefully you get the main things in, like you say, you plan ahead so that you're not trying to do it or trying to turn on a dime. Um, I think also to put, you know, building a system back from the client, you know, is something that's really held us in good in high stead with them. And when I say that, I, I've never been part of a dealer group. So got my first day for sell in 2009. It was 10 days from the bottom of the GFC. I thought I was either the dumbest guy or the smartest guy. Um, Still don't know (laughs) what that answer was. But one thing it taught me was because you have a blank piece of paper and how you want to build your systems, you can take the legal approach and build the most rock-solid business. And from a compliance point of view, you never get any clients. So Mm. by taking the client-first approach and working backwards, what it did do was you know, sort of triage the necessities versus the the nice to haves. And, you know, if you sort of, you know, my dad's a pilot and he always used to say when he was flying a plane, he'd always imagine that, 
myself, my brothers, and mum went on that plane. So he'd always do the right thing on that plane. That was his mental space. And I think yeah. if advisors sort of took the same approach to their grandmother or their parents, you know, if this is I'm signing at my parents here and I want to do the right thing, but what would I do along those ways? And taking that sort of approach, it just ch- it really changes the narrative. And to me, it really comes back to a, a client first policy. And, and once you do that, um, you often find that you actually supersede the requirements from a legislative point of view um, mm. just because you just want to do good shit. Totally. I've actually noticed with some of our our younger guys when they first start, like associate advisors that are coming into that advisor role, that it's interesting how people think about it that um, you say, like, what do you think that the client should do? Trying to get them to critically think about what the strategy is and they say, oh, you know, I think this or they should have a, you know, 50-50 portfolio and that. I'm like, okay, well, what about that? You know, would as, and then you ask the question like if that was your mum or if that was like what would you do if it was your money? And then all of a sudden the, the, the yes. answer is different and it's not a, like an ethics thing or saying that no. the investments are not good, but people think about it and go, oh, yeah, actually if that was my half a million bucks, maybe I wouldn't put it into a, a bond fund that's returning, you know, 0.5 of a percent or something like that yeah, but you want something more that's right you think about it as your financial plan and what would, what should the financial advice be it's different so uh yeah i think it, it helps in a, in a lot of um scenarios brett you're you've grown a business you well, you've grown multiple businesses in um you know different different countries and and jurisdictions what what have been the big lessons are that around um team and and yeah, what can we take away from from that for you? One thing we've tried to keep was a very flat management structure. Um, we know we can only do that for so long, but to me, keeping the coal face close to the decision maker is, is an important part because those people, whether it's an admin officer or a CSO or a power planner, um, they are doing a very specific and specialised job that if you really sit down with them, give them that time, um, they're full of fantastic ideas. You know, mm. some of the some of the most simple things that just would smack you in the face, you won't see. And yeah. this person goes, look, I don't want to say this, but this. And I was like, well, why did you tell me that a year ago? I didn't know. <laughs> you know, to me, yeah, that's a big one. And, and you know, I think I, I try and keep my door open as often as possible. That's the big one. And, and people say, I'm sorry to bug you, but and it's like never apologise for that. You know, yeah, if my door's closed, then that's what I don't want to be, you know, so communication in that regard, but being available. I think when your people are part of that decision-making process and when they're emotionally invested in the business, uh, good things happen. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have a high turnover of, of employees. You don't have, um, you know, lagging problems that just keep cropping up because you fix them, you nip them on the butt. And mm-hmm. to me, it's that being running a business that's dynamic, is important because things are changing. The world, then one thing COVID's taught us is the world keeps turning. You know, we go through a pandemic, yeah, yeah. but guess what? It's still, you know, Tuesday and we're still suns rising east and setting in the west. <laughs> so if you want to put your feet up and rest in your laurels, that's fine. Um, but to me, I think you need to work out whether you're building a business and what style of business and what type of business versus, um, mm. you know, whether you're just trying to buy yourself a job because um, I think that's the biggest thing we look at is, running teams and now with in two countries it's a it's quite easy you know we've got microsoft teams we've got zoom we've got whatsapp is a big one you know we've got different whatsapp groups they go along and and both for the company and also at the different offices um mm. and and uh just keeping that dialogue going i mean the good thing is technology there these days that it doesn't matter and that's why i think you know uh location agnostic advisors is has, is taking off because mm. you can do the job from Timbuktu if you wanted to. Uh, mm. In our case, we're just doing it from the Middle East. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think for us, one of the lessons that I've learned, and I learned this one the hard way, but with our teams in, especially when you think that things, ne- well, you realise that things need to change with one part of what you're doing or a particular area or whatever, that um, yes, you definitely get good insights from the different team members that are the ones that are on the coal face doing this work day in and day out. But for us, I found that before we used to go, okay, well, I'll um, realise that there's an issue here, so we'll go away and I'll work on it or I'll get someone in the, in the leadership team to work on it and then we'll go back and say, okay, here's the thing, I'm trying to save people time and say here's something that's almost done. 
let's give it a go and we can we can fix it as we go but it was about and it's probably like only in the last year that we started going okay well before, maybe do some of the the research and thinking around it but saying to people hey guys we've got this thing that's happened we we reckon that this is an issue because of this this is what we're trying to achieve what do you guys think in terms of how we can get there and half the time that you know maybe up to 80 percent of the stuff that we'd come up with would be the same and then there's a couple of bits that they add on which make it even better but then they own a hundred percent of all of what's getting done as opposed to you know me saying okay now we need to be doing this and then people can feel like they haven't had their voice heard or their opinion wasn't important as part of that process so it's not massively changing the the outcome although it is changing a bit for the better but it's um yeah from the team feel much more like their voice is is heard and that they are driving the changes that i think need to happen especially when you're business now one of the things i think the biggest things from from a leadership point of view that i've really embraced and learned almost by accident in the last sort of 10 years was people often have a stigma in terms of how they are to operate in a workforce and i'll come to you and a natural thing is i come to you with problems mm. you try and turn it around and say okay that's a problem how would you fix it so what i want them to end up doing is coming to me and saying here's the problem here's what i think we should do can i do it mm. then suddenly from your point of view it's just either yes or no but they've empowered they've been in, you know empowered with that job and also the result but also to from a leadership point of view less time yeah totally yeah. i actually had um david dugan on the podcast the other week who's a coach that i've worked with for for a long time and he he is this thing which is they call it one three one so it's like one problem three potential solutions what's the one option that you think we should follow and I use that with our team and it's great because then they're forcing them to think critically, a few different options, yeah. save you time, then you pick and move forward instead of going, oh, here's an issue, and then you need to spend time unpacking and, and addressing it. So, Because the um, problem is if you've got four employees and four employees bring you four problems, um, you've got no time for yourself. Mm. Plus, from a development perspective, I think for your team, it's great to get them thinking about problems and sometimes the solutions that people are coming up with are different to the ones that we would as well. Yeah, no, you're spot on. And that's why you hire them. Yeah, you, know, you want their IP. <laughs> yeah, totally. Brett, what's coming up for you, mate? What's uh, what's get your focus over the next little bit? Mate, right now, now that we've built Rome, now it's a matter of, uh, you know, putting our heads down and, and seeing how far we can take it. You know, I think the big thing for us right now is we're getting key clusters of new expats in areas, which we're, we're tapping into there. But to me right now, we've now got a problem where, you know, like we discussed on our last um, uh, last episode, you know, we get a lot of inquiries, a lot. And it's servicing those inquiries. And right now we do it by doing long hours and those sort of things. To us, it's now 2.0. We're looking past COVID. Yep. Um, it's a matter of getting bums on seats. So we're starting to talk to folks who are interested in moving overseas and doing some pretty cool stuff. You know, we we talk to people who, you know, from a client base, these people are fascinating. They are some of the coolest people you've ever met in your life and you've never heard of them. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the latest client we've got coming out right now, which is a famous shoe design in Paris. And part of our SOA is talking about there's a Milan fashion house trying to poach her you know, how do we design her finances so she doesn't have to worry about which country she's based in. So mm. that's the sort of, you know, that's what AOSIs look like. They're, they're very different to uh, to what people write back in Oz, even though there is, a, it's an asset compliant format and everything, but just the content is quite different. So, you know, to us, it's a matter of, you know, we're growing the business, but, you know, also making sure we adhere to our no dickhead rule. Um, we don't want to kill our culture. You know, our culture is one of very much a flat management structure and teammates, you know, not employees. Um, it's a real cohesive type of, of uh, offices on both sides, both in the Australian office and Dubai office. And we just want to work with people who want to do a brilliant job, want to be a specialist. You know, if they want to really, you know, delve deep into it, you know, when we've had advisors come on in the past, the first thing I tell them to do is read our website and they go, which part? And they said, all of it. <laughs> and because there's so much content on there that they will pick it up and then as part of our training my job is then to help them join the dots you know they had that basic knowledge as a financial planner but when you add the cross jurisdictional dimensional advice into it 
you know, that's mm. a big part of what we what we're trying to achieve right now is the advice that I provide to a client in New York is different from London, which is different from Dubai, which is different from Hong Kong. Um, mm. There's a lot of moving parts. And now that uh, we've got the common reporting standard, data sharing and those sort of things, people have stopped trying to hide money and squirrel mm. away in far corners of the world. They need now being more compliant. So they're coming mm. to us and saying, how do I optimize from a tax point of view my assets but don't get in trouble with any of the regulators so it's been a great result for from our point of view because people want to do the right thing but they also want to do make sure they're not paying excessive tax so to me now it's a matter of uh, you know we've built the whole systems we've built this system so that uh, you know we're talking to one gentleman right now he's looking at coming across to Dubai and he wants to come across for 10 years and then after 10 years, he want, or five or 10 years, not sure yet, but then he would like to return to Australia, work in Australia for another five or 10 years, and uh, then retire. You know, he's able to do that uh, by mm-hmm. working through Atlas. He comes and joins the Dubai office, he works there, and then guess what? You know, when he wants to retire, yeah, and return to Australia, he goes back to Australia, works in the Australian office, still got his client base, still everything, nothing changes, just his tax status and how much tax he pays and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> And then, then he retires. But, uh, you know, and that's been the goal, you know, that we've added a, a mortgage arm to the business last year. Um, that was fantastic. That's been a real, real success for us because once again, like a financial planner, an expat mortgage broker is different from a mortgage broker because you mm. need to know which banks you're talking to. And, you know, yeah. based on a jurisdiction, you know, if you're from Hong Kong, talk to this bank or if you're from Dubai, talk to this bank because there's haircuts they take on yeah. salary, haircuts on taxes and those sort of things. Mm. Um, so the mortgage business is going really well. You know, really, really pre- pleased with that. And, and uh, Jeremy Harper's been doing a fantastic job with that, really just getting great outcomes for clients. You know, we can't, uh, we can't thank him enough for coming on board with us. Um, down the track, looking at bringing a tax arm internally. Uh, right now we provide an insane amount of uh, tax return uh, referrals out there yeah, no so doubt. and it's not to us about the money it's about retaining the delivery of the service you know those mm. those key points that we're very proud of in terms of how clients are handled not to say that the people we work with right now uh, are bad but it is a little bit disjointed because of different firms whereas yeah. you know expats one thing expats resonate with all the time they say we just want someone to make the problems go away and mm. if we can have in-house mortgages, which we've now got in-house tax, in-house planning, um, you can see where, where we're sort of heading, where each office we have will have embedded specialists. And um, using a sort of a hub-and-spoke mentality like we're done here in Dubai, you know, uh, in a given day I can talk to someone in Saudi Arabia, Germany, France, Angola, and then back to Dubai again. And that will be just a, a day for us. And it's it's pretty cool because what it means is, you're, if you like solving problems, then expat advice is exactly the sort of work you need to do because you need to think three-dimensionally sometimes in terms of how you deliver something. You, know, you might have a client in Dubai working for a US firm who has a 401k from the US and mm. we, don't want him, we don't want him to redeem that 401k back in Australia because it would be double taxed. So we get them retire in Dubai, redeem the 401k, then we repatriate that 401k money back to us. So that's the sort of thing we do. You know, to mm-hmm. me, it's, it's you know, from a chronology point of view, really just ma- mind mapping out um, their expat journey and then putting the financial advice around each component and uh, time stamping it. Some pretty interesting problem solving there. Uh, mm. I can't actually see what shoes you've got on, but I'm hoping that that client hooked you up with uh, with with some good uh, designer shoes off the off the back of your SOA. They're, kit, right? they're lady shoes, mate. So uh, no, the answer's no. Uh, well, yeah, I don't <laughs> judge you're in a safe space here, but um, <laughs> it, it's 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 interesting. You know, I've got one client who's the head of security for the UN, and he's the guy that flies into the worst places at the last minute. So when Kabul and Afghanistan was falling, he flew in to manage those last three days. Uh, oh. When Russia invaded Ukraine, he f- oh. so his WhatsApp messages are hilarious. You know, how's it going? Oh, it's not too bad. By the way, how's my portfolio going? Should I contribute to super? <laughs> I've got a bit of positive cash flow. I mean, this guy's in the middle of a war zone and he's, talking about cons- and, he's, and he's talking about concessional contributions because he's running positive cash flow on his property. Wow. So that's the that's cool great. bit. 
Well, mate, uh, really appreciate you sharing your insights. For anyone listening in that's that's keen to learn a bit more about the opportunities, because I know that you are looking for um, great people for a handful of different roles across the group, what's the best way for them to learn more or to reach out? Mate, uh, on our website, it's got everything. So it's uh, the W's Atlas Wealth, A-T-L-A-S Wealth.com. Um, we've actually got a, a careers page on there that people can sort of uh, send through their details if they want us to uh, to have a look and have a chat. Um, the big thing for us is, you know, with any business that's growing, you know, we need to talk to everyone from bottom to the top and everything in between. So if you do have a landing wing of wanting to get into this space, one thing I'm going to assure you, it's a growing space. You know, even with COVID and a lot of expats coming back to Australia, um, there's still probably 600, 700,000 Australians still living overseas even after the pandemic. Mm. So... It's a business that, um, to me, it's I wouldn't say it's infinite, but it's there's a lot of opportunity there for people. You know, job for life, one hundred percent. Awesome, mate. Well, um, I'm sure you guys have plenty of fun at the embassy, along with all of that um, problem solving as well. So uh, get around that for anyone that's interesting. Brett, mate, so good to watch you uh, kicking so so many goals. Who knows when we do the next podcast? You might be in Amsterdam or New York, or uh, you know, have, look, have it, it's. To us, we'll be client directed. You know, to me, now that we've done the first office overseas, it's a critical mass issue. It's all about dollars. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it will be if we get past a certain number of clients in a certain jurisdiction and we're able to do it in the same way, um, 100%. We're always open to offer, you know, opening new offices. We're talking to a gentleman at the moment who is considering coming in as a partner. Um, he'll inject a bit of capital. We'll come in as an equity partner with him and we'll help him kick it off. To me, it's. I'd probably be embarrassed if I told you what my real goals are, how big they are. You know, from our point of view, we just keep on marching and as long as we're making the headway every day, um, who knows where we'll be in, in the next couple of years. Awesome, mate. Well, it's great to watch. So really appreciate you sharing your your insights and, yeah, look forward to the next one. Mate, thanks for having me on and uh, look after yourself. Thank you, mate. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit sad that we won't get to see you at the next XY event, but uh, no doubt that homecoming will come at some point and we can uh, catch up and talk about the stamp it then. Mate, I enjoyed the virtual XYs because that was great because I could actually dial in for those. So. <laughs> yeah, nice one.